every fall semester since 2005, the library has had the privilege of hosting lectures and conferences in celebration of this special month. This <coughs> afternoon, we are pleased to have with us Dr. Carmen Ferreira, uh, Professor of Renaissance Studies in the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures, who has been at Villanova since 1993. She is a native of Madrid, Spain, and holds a PhD from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Before coming to the US, she studied Hispanic philology at the Universidad Complutense of Madrid and political philosophy at the University of Paris with professors such as Herbert Marcuse and Gilles Deleuze, among others. She also spent her years studying Arabic language and literature at the University of Baghdad with an IRP scholarship. Dr. Barida has published extensive books, <coughs> including two books, two critical editions, and a, tr a translation over th and over 30 scholarly papers on a variety of issues related to early modern historiography, the history of the book, and practices of reading and writing. Her talk today, which is entitled Early Modern Multimedia from Valencia to Cusco, it's part of a new project on publication processes in early modern Europe. So, I'm going to stop talking now and turn the stage to Dr. Berry. Thank you. Thank you, Ming, for your nice presentation. <laughs> And thank you also especially to Falvi Library for organizing the Hispanic Heritage Month and for inviting me to present my, uh, my research. So new information technologies like cybernetics or the internet create new challenges in the way societies organize knowledge, disseminate information, and publish texts. But develop, the development of new technologies which radically change the way societies communicate have existed in different time periods. The printing press slowly transformed forever the ways early modern societies dealt with writing, reading, communicating, etc. For instance, um, publication in early modern times meant several different things. It could mean printing a text, circulating handwriting manuscripts, or publicly reading a text aloud. Consider published when read aloud in different parts of a city. Likewise, in our society, the internet is rapidly changing the concept of publishing itself. Today I examine a specific publication event that took place in Valencia in the 17th century which not only emphasized the information that needed to be circulated, but also evoked in a symbolic way the revolution brought along by the new technology of the printing press. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm going to read my uh, presentation, but uh, please uh, feel free to interrupt me if you need some clarification when, when I'm reading. At four o'clock in the afternoon on Quasimodo Sunday in 1662, the Manifestación, a public procession organized by Valencia, started in the city, in the streets of the city. The event marked the publication of a program of festivities that would celebrate the Immaculate Conception in the coming month. The city has erupted in joy over Pope Alexander VII's brief on the Immaculate, which has also delighted other Spanish cities and the King Philip IV himself. Something special was clearly in order. For previous events, Valencia had announced its program in the usual way, whereby the town crier will walk to strategic points of different neighborhoods, reading publicly the program, accompanied by the jurats or city magistrates, and the sound of kettle drums. On this occasion, Valencia devised an unparalleled spectacle. Instead of resorting to the town crier, the city brought out to its streets a magnificent textual, visual, and musical performance. Weeks be before the city's manifestation took place, several Valencian institutions, for instance, the nobility or the various academic disciplines of the university, 
had organized public celebrations characterized by unprecedented splendorous creativity and extravagant spending. With their manifestación, the city magistrates, representing the city as an inclusive community, were not content to simply emulate the previous celebrations, but sought to exceed them all. In order to announce the different activities of the celebration the city has planned, three triumphal wagons were brought out along the streets. The wagons stage a narrative sequence, a tableau vivant. 200 trumpeteers opened the procession. Several heralds on horseback dressed in satin precede the three wagons, each of which prominently display the city's coat of arms. Skillful dancers performed by the oldest guild of Valencia, I quote, making agile jumps, turning in a variety of ways without making any mistake, gave way to the first wagon of the manifestación of this extraordinary publication event through a public procession. My work today focuses on the similar process of publication staged by the manifestación as recounted by the city chronicle Juan Bautista de Valda in Solemnes Fiestas que celebró Valencia a la Inmaculada Concepción de la Virgen María. The central role that the printing and engraving presses played in the event and the complex meanings it evoked has thus far not received any critical attention. The first wagon represented hell. It was painted with voracious flames, evil forces and monsters. At the top, an infernal dragon was shown vanquished by the Virgin so that Mary's triumph of her original scene precede the sequence. Two musicians are seen playing and a paloteado dance was performed in a wagon, the dancer supposedly scoffing at the infernal furies. <coughs> so we see here uh, the dragon, the coat of arms of Valencia, and of course here the monsters in, in hell, and the musicians and the dancers. And of course we see all this decoration, the elaborate decoration of the wagon. The following wagon was preceded by eight, eight young skilled men dancing in a variety of styles with castanets, swords and shields. This second wagon carried a printing press. The third and last wagon of the singular manifestación displayed an engraving press. Both the printing and the engraving presses were shown in full activity. In each of the last two wagons, eager pressmen were printing, or pretending to print, material related to the celebration of the Immaculate. According to Valda, the material printed in those presses was immediately disseminated from the wagons. We understand that it was distributed to the onlookers of the extraordinary publication procession. <coughs> Balda described at length the design of the second wagon. Beautiful moldings, cornices, columns, and pilasters of gold and refined colors. At the top on a throne was a large sculpture of the Immaculate painted with extraordinary care and pleasant colors. On the front, Valencia's coat of arms with the characteristic bat was prominently displayed. Along the wagon, several children were dressed as angels in multicolored satin with showy garlands mm -hmm. and flags painted in gold. In the center of the wagon was a printing press. Two pressmen, a puller and a beater dressed as angels, could not stop printing and distributing a broadside with a series of poems written, written for the event, according to Valda, in our Valencian tongue with eloquent language and adorned with sharp concepts. Next to the press, elegantly dressed with a cape and a hat, a gentleman held in his left hand a gathering that is a piece of paper folded, using a gesture apparently indicated that it has just been printed. So we have here the Immaculate. Uh, we have here a pelican, with, which was the emblem of Christ. Of Christ. 
So the children dress as angels with the flags, and we have here the printing press with the two men, I mean, uh, one with the, the puller with the paper and the beater with the ink, and here we have the gentleman with this piece of paper. Sorry, my pointer doesn't work in this with this screen. A dance by men dressed as gypsies precedes the no less beautiful third wagon, which in the front carried three musicians playing and singing sweet consonances and melodious air to the Virgin. The exterior of the wagon was elaborately adorned with hieroglyphs and illustrations. A pressman also dressed as an angel was doing his best at the press to print an engraving of the Immaculate. The pressman has his left hand on the wheel of the press and the right on the platen, that's it. He's shown in the moment of printing the image. In a small table behind him, a bottle of ink and instruments for engraving can be seen. On the right side of the wagon, a man raises his left hand as if to show on lookers a piece of paper, which we presume to be the engraving distributed from the wagon. The Chronicle explained that the image was designed for the occasion and was inspired by the poems printed in the preceding wagon. The engraving was printed on regular paper for everybody, but on taffeta, means silk, for a group of selected people, a clear indication of how, in every imaginable circumstance, the printed production helped signify social differentiation. So we see here the musicians playing here and singing, and here we see the pressman with uh, one hand in the wheel, and here the platen, which was the, the place in the press where actually the, uh, the engraving was, pre was printed in the, on the paper. And see here we see a man raising this, this, uh, this piece of paper, probably the engraving itself, and we see here a small table where we have the ink, so the instruments to, uh, to engrave. And it's interesting also this, all this decoration of the, of the wagon, and here the, at the top, the angels. The engraving was reprinted, reprinted the following year. Balda indicates it is the same engraving shown as frontispiece of this book, but in a smaller format. In other words, the illustration distributed from the wagon was used as frontispiece or engraved title page of the chronicle Solemnes Fiestas that the city has commissioned Balda to write. So the first thing the reader notices when opening Solemnes Fiestas is thus the same engraving, supposedly the original, the original document that circulating, circulated, according to the chronicle, it literally flew through the streets during the extraordinary celebration. The migration into the chronicle of the engraving printed for everybody, the same graphic material circulating and flying over the streets during the manifestation, contributed, among other things, to corroborate the authenticity of Balda's written testimony, published a year after the celebration, when readers could still remember having seen the image. The illustration was adjusted to fit the quarto format of the printed volume of more than 700 pages. Balda identifies the person depicted. Alexander VII is delivering the document to the Archbishop of Placentia, ambassador to the Spanish monarch Philip IV. Philip IV is portrayed with the crown at his feet, the golden fleece around his neck, beneath the royal coat of arms. Strangely enough, the chronicle does not mention the king's presence in the illustration, but does mention that the city magistrates dress in their majestic toga, togas were portrayed in a recognizable way. The image clearly expresses the city magistrate's loyalty to the Pope as well as to the monarch, but mainly stresses Valencia's pride in its early devotion to the Immaculate Conception. Valda emphasized that Valencia was one of the first Spanish cities to embrace the Immaculate Conception's doctrine which was perceived a clear sign of loyalty to the king. 
So this was a very controversial doctrine, uh, especially between Dominicans and Franc Franciscans. But uh, Philip IV personally supported and was, uh, for he was very important, this uh, doctrine of the Immac Immaculate Conception. So it became, at a certain moment, it became a political issue in, in Spain. At the same time that the poems and the engraving were printed and thrown to the spectators, the program itself, listing vari various events, was published. Along the crossroads of the itinerary, at the very moment where the wagons were crossing, on each street corner, two town officials were posting printed announcements, <coughs> excuse me, so that all the city will carry the information. The informative broadside included an image similar to the engraving printed in the wagon, that's the, that the, that's the, the image, and explained the rationale for the celebration. It encouraged all citizens to actively participate. Valda described the broadside, which he noted was printed in the largest size of paper, that it was a, a large poster. I quote, the motivations we led to such glorious demonstrations of joy were written down with elegant prose in our Valencian language, as it has always been the custom. It also spelled out the celebrations the city was planning for the four festive days in May. The announcement mapped the itinerary of the general procession and urged it to excel in the decoration of luminaria, altars, arches, floats, crosses, and tabernacles. In order to encourage the citizens' participation, the city offered four prizes for each category of decoration, as well for everybody else depending on the inventiveness and the quality of the ornamentation displayed the city offered helping with the expenses. So it was a, f a large poster with the same image that was thrown thr from the, the wagon, and with a rationale, a text explaining why this celebration, and also explaining all the prices that were going to be distributed. It is likely that Jerónimo de Villagrasa, who a few years earlier was appointed Valencia's official, official typographer, participated in organizing the manifestación. The most prolific printer in the Kingdom of Valencia, Villagrasa was in charge of printing the city's celebrative chronicles that since the mid-17th century were profusely illustrated with engravings, a relatively new technology for book illustration. Probably both the printing and the engraving presses parade through the city belong to his workshop. The astutely designed manifestación display a remarkable tribute to the topographic arts, the relatively new technology of the printing press. It emphasized particular characteristics of print culture. For instance, a poem referring to the printing press placed on the wagon where the poems were being printed, playing on the Valencian word roca, meaning both rock and wagon, underlined underlines the, everlast the everlasting dimension that typography confers on a printed text. I quote, since Valencia wants its history to be remembered in perpetual memory, it is being published with public demonstrations in the wagon rock, La Roca. Printing for everybody on presses displayed as the central feature of a publication event constitutes without doubt a spectacular strategy for publicizing the celebration to come. The extravagant living scenario, which printed in front of the onlookers the message to divulgate, exploited in significant ways the use of typography to intensify modes of communication in a still predominantly oral and visual culture. The performance publicized both the celebrative manifestación as well as to the specific messages it intended to circulate. It emphasized the print culture's ability to disseminate information, to easily multiply copies of a text. The orchestrated multiplication of printed letter and engraved image inundated from various directions the urban space and intensified the circulation of the information 
which was being widely communicated right at the very moment it was published. The spectators participated as immediate consumers of the poems and image just printed, reading at the same time on a posted broadside the news of the festive events to be celebrated in a few weeks. An array of circumstances of interest and intentions shaped the central displays of the press's parade through the street. Why displaying the presses and why at this time? <coughs> Among others, two months earlier, when the papal decree reached Valencia, a group of respected local theologians argued that the bull did not add anything new, but simply reignite, reignited a long-standing controversy on the first instant of Mary's concessions, conceptions. The Pope's document included, however, explicit instructions. The dogma has to be published without delay and disseminated as widely as possible, both orally and in writing. Valencia's archbishop immediately translated the text into Spanish, printed and publicized it, posting it in the streets, reading it both in the pulpits and with great ceremony all over the city. The efficiency of the print production to mobilize information staged by the Manifestación could have been a way to reiterate in a celebrity fashion the urgency felt two months earlier for publishing the bull of this controversial dogma. The joyful display of the two active presses suggests, moreover, a variety of meanings and interpretations. The attribute of typographic culture staged by the Manifestación resonated in complex ways. The ability of the printing text and image to disseminate knowledge also evokes here a, public, a powerful symbolic dimension. Certainly, Valencia's ceremony of publication visualized, we could say, a cosmic impulse of the mobility and, and vigor of the printed word, of the printing press to propagate knowledge. The ubiquity of the typographic world, in sum, is here shown reaching Valencia from heaven. In other words, a celestial printing shop was staged in this materiality, busy printing directly in the heart, as several poems emphasize. I'm quoting. By this invention, the noble and loyal city of Valencia aspires to print all the, in all the pious heart devotion to the Immaculate. Another poem. Virgin, your purity is published by the engraving which is engraved in our hearts. In different ways, the poems printed in the itinerant press re-elaborate metaphors dealing with typographic activity. In Adam's printing shop was accomplished a perfect printing job. I'm quoting, everybody is astonished by the perfection of this engraving, the Immaculate, and the more so now that we see that it comes from a perfect and clean mold. It was printed in Adam's printing shop. The hustle and bustle that dominated a typographic office, such as the one Don Quixote de la Mancha visited in Barcelona, was staged in Valencia, far away from the mundane, somewhat noisy and dirty place that was likely an early modern printing shop. In fact, beyond the carnival traditions that could in part have shaped certain aspects of the Manifestación, the wagons refashioned God as supreme printer. Several poems allude to the creator's activity as perfect typographer, master of the new technology, presenting the gesture of paying attention to the materials and instrument of the trade, for instance, to the quality of the paper. I quote, in order to print these poems, God has chosen the paper and inspecting it carefully from the first to the last page, he did not find any blotch. Indeed, the wagons dramatize in a divine way, in a sort of contrafactum, 
a printing task, God's choice of the new technology, transporting to a celestial sphere a terrestrial printing press in ceaseless activity. A poem printed in the wagon mentioned the circumstance. The angels have become printers in order to publish the Virgin's triumph over sin in the first instant of her conception. Preside at the top of the second wagon by the large sculpture of the Immaculate who vanquished the infernal dragon of sin, maybe in a fashion similar to the printer master surveying his shop, as we see there, the pressman angels worked in a circuit environment at the worldly task of inking the form and placing the paper over the tympan of the printing press. Now, here's interesting, we see this is an engraving press and we see um, it was, it, the, the wheel was really very hard to turn. So we see here an office, a pressman using both hand and even uh, one foot to turn it. So it's very different than what we saw in the wagon. The physicality of printing text and images underscore here a link between graphic materiality and immaculate spirituality. Since the beginning of the 17th century, poets, preachers, and playwriters were rewriting metaphors from the graphic activity which presented the Immaculate as written virgin, as exhaustless book printed by God in order to teach humankind. The Immaculate is linked in, with all kinds of material aspects and instruments of the typographic world such as the printer's copy, the original manuscript which copy a text without mistake, the whiteness of, pap of perfect paper without stain, paper with no imperfections or ink blot to stain the page. The smoke of the printing ink contrasts with the light God used to print the Immaculate, who is described also as a divine engraving in several poems of the Manifestación, I'm quoting, Every fine engraving is made from paper and smoke, but it is extraordinary that this divine engraving, which is the Immaculate, is made from paper and light. I would like to conclude by pointing out a literal and specific dimension of the ubiquity of the engraved image and the printed text celebrated by Valencia's Manifestación. Two decades later, in Cusco, in a series of paintings depicting the Corpus Christi procession, a local Inca painter was inspired by the engravings of the wagons in Valda's Chronicle. The paintings creatively reconceive Valencia's processional wagons. So here we have one of these Inca wagons. Here we have another one. Another one, the detail. So here we have the one in the C Valencian Chronicle and how is it, uh, the Immaculate here becomes St. James in, uh, in Cusco, but uh, St. Jerome writing at his desk is, is um, under, underlying there. The wagon with the engraving press was refashioned as a wagon from the Andean Hospital of Naturales. In this imaginary Cusqueño wagon, the three musicians are depicted at the front. The Immaculate, or I mean or this here, <laughs> is replaced by the Virgin of the Candelaria, which was the uh, patron of the Hospital de Naturales. The engraving press is shown with the wheel. The pressman is making the same gesture of turning the wheel but he has no platen. And the man raising his hand to the public on the side of the wagon no longer holds a piece of paper. So we see, we see the same, the press, that part of the press, but the platen, which as I say is the important place where the, engra the, the engraving was, was printed, here is missing. So it's only this piece of, uh, of, the, of the press, of the printing press. Now the small table here with the ink and the instruments to engrave also is, not, is not shown here. And the man with what we suppose is the showing the engraving that has just been uh, 
uh, print here is raising his hand. So it's the same gesture, but it has nothing. It's empty. Apparently, the painter did not understand fully the artifact he was copying, because printing and engraving presses did not exist at that time in Cusco, although they exist in, in, uh, in Mexico and in Lima, but they still had not arrived uh, in Cusco. Thus, much like pages, the pages thrown from the wagons in Valencia, the image of the engraving press had taken flight, reaching Cusco well ahead of its material form. Thank you very much. And here we have some other images of this uh, extraordinary procession in, uh, in Cusco, the paintings of the procession. So, uh, questions, comments? Yes. But in Cusco, this was the main event. This was not the projection of another event that was going to come. N no, and it's different because in Cusco, this is a corpus procession, which they, they were also in Valencia. And, uh, and, uh, and part of the, of the wagons are not copied from the manifestation, but the, from the procession. Because they were, the wagons, I mean, with different decorations, were coming in different events. Yes. Yes, so it's, yeah, it's, not, uh, it's not a publication event, mm -hmm. but some of the wagons come from uh, the procession to the Immaculate. But still, still in Valencia today, in the Corpus Christi, you see some of the wagons, they are still, uh, so the, yeah. It's, it's and, and Cusco, I think, also in the Corpus Christi is still a, an important event. So yes. you're so saying that the publication that was in Valencia uh, traveled, uh, was brought to yes, actually, by the church? Actually, yes, the, the, the book, as I said, the Chronicle was, that was printed one year after and it's 700 pages, so it's a fairly large chronicle with a lot of engravings, which were very expensive. So it has over, I guess, probably more than 40 uh, wagons engraved, I mean, engra engraving. So it was, um, it was brought by the, the Archbishop who, who was, um, who was in Madrid at the time he was published in Valencia and who was an art, coll art collector. So he brought his art collection to Cusco and we know that he brought a copy of the, of the Chronicle, of Valda's Chronicle. So that's what exactly the, the painter, uh, who probably was not able to read, so really but not, didn't exactly know what it was uh, this, this uh, press. But yeah, we know that it was directly copied from, uh, from the book, from the engravings in the, in the book. But, yeah. Yes. What is very interesting to me is that <clears throat> nowadays there is a lot of talk about intermediality as the next thing after inter intertextuality. And here we have an example from the 16th century of exactly that. <laughs> Sylvia, that's exactly what I'm trying to uh, <laughs> divulgate that, I mean, the 16th, the 17th century, I mean, we talk about this thing, we talk about hypertext, uh, we talk about intertextuality, I mean, of course, it's in different ways, but some of the issues that were raised, I mean, we can trace very interesting um, kind of analogies, uh, mm -hmm. and it's, I think it's fascinating, as, as you say. Of course, I also have to say that the opposite. I think the fact that now we have all these debates on intertextuality, on, on new um, on information technologies, help us to look at the past with different eyes. And I think part of the very important interest in the, in the, in the book, in the, in the book as, as an artifact, comes right at the moment when we're starting to read, um, I mean, e-books, et cetera, et cetera, and we are really starting to see things in the early modern books that before maybe we take for granted. So I think it's a very dialectic. I mean, I think the past has to be studied from the present and vice versa. Yeah, I think that's, that's uh, it's a lot of fun. We should try to team teach yeah. something. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> of course, the 17th century is a very sophisticated society, so you see a lot of the stuff that we are actually seeing today already taking place then. But maybe you said it and I missed it. Why Cusco, of all places? Uh, why, why Cusco? Well, I think, um, I think it was in part, is, is, there is always a fact, I mean, I think it chance. I mean, I think the fact that this bishop uh, brought that book and 
it was it was it was uh, seen by the um, because he this our bishop was the one also I mean commissioned these paintings, but why Cusco? Well, Cusco still was a very important uh, place at that time and had a very important Corpus Christi celebration. So I think it was chance, but it maybe would not have happened the same way in some other city. So I think there was a bit of chance and the fact that Cusco had um, uh, this very elaborate Corpus Christi. I mean, actually it's interesting because the wagons, uh, Cusco didn't build wagons for the, the, the procession until the 18th century. So it was a completely an extraordinary artifact that they have never seen. But they copy and integrate in this, in this um, paintings that on the other side are very realistic. So they are really portraits of the people. We can recognize the specific houses, uh, the, the palaces, etc. So the, the, the paintings, they combine a very realistic view of, of, of the city with artifacts that were invented or copied from, uh, from um, this chronicle. But I think Pusco was also a very sophisticated um, uh, city at that time for different reasons than, than Valencia. I mean, both of them, I mean, both cities are very peripheral in some ways. This is not the court. And I think that's also very important. Like yes. Uh, Mexico, right? Mexico City would have been more important at the time. And uh, maybe um, even Chile, Santiago or something. Well, uh, no, I well, think still well, Lima well, was, was Lima, yeah, right? Lima, 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 Lima and Pusco. Were, but right. Lima, Lima at that time, Lima had uh, printing presses and, and important conference and also. Maybe, maybe more Cusco than Lima because you have to remember that Cusco was the city yes. capital of the Inca Empire. Yes. And when the Spaniards got there, Cusco was a huge city. Yes, yes, and it was the center of the very, very la uh, sophisticated empire. And actually all this, as I said, in this, in this procession, you see the Inca leaders, I mean, that, that again, mm -hmm. where we can, we know the names, I mean, etc. So, yes. Um, in terms of, the thing is, at, at that time still, which is, Interesting, they were not printing presses in, 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 in Cusco, although they were in other parts of the, uh, but of the, of, of the of New Spain. From the, from the yes, Spain. but of yeah. course it was one of them, I mean, it was the capital of the Inca Empire, there's no question, it was a very important city. Yes. The first printing that was done was done in Quechua, right? Or not engraving, but I mean the, the printing. <coughs> I'm surprised that there was in Lima, I thought it was somewhere else than Lima for the first printing, because the first printing was done for actually for the Evangelio, for the yes. evangelization that was in, you know, done in Quechua. In Quechua. Well, we have, Spanish. it's very interesting, we have at that time, I mean, the, uh, in the late 16th century, we have polyphony in, in Quechua, and it's exactly the polyphony, the European polyphony, but uh, sung in, in, uh, in Quechua. So yes, definitely there was a very na I mean, natural thing of mixing the two, the new technologies or the new type of, of music with, or the different type of music with the Quechua, definitely, yes. Sorry, but I have so many questions. That was very interesting. <coughs> what was um, interesting to me that I don't know much about this, that the translation of the texts were to, not to Valenciano in Valencia, but to Spanish. What does that mean? Because I imagine that Valenciano was a, a very important language at that time in Valencia, and I, is this some imperial imposition, or there were certain texts that were in Spanish and certain texts that were in Valenciano? Can you say Yes, something? I mean, that, that's always a, a very important part in all these many uh, cities, chronicles uh, printed in the 17th century in Valencia. So they are bilingual. I mean, so certain things are done, are certain poems uh, could be in Valencian, certain poems are in, 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 in Spanish. Um, they, um, they wanted also to use the, the Spanish because there was a way to communicate with, I mean, uh, with the court, etc. So it's very, so they, they um, um, the main, I mean, the, the narrative is always in Spanish, but you can, when you transcribe poems, they po some poems could be in, in, in Valencian. So is and then sometimes like says like here, you say, well, you know, all the announcements about the, the awards or the rationale that was written in Valencia. It's not transcribed in the, actually in the Chronicle, but um, other poems, yes, they are transcribed. So, but it's a very interesting issue to see how they change from one language and the other. You don't feel, I mean, it's, there's always the, an, um, an interesting, um, 
trying to keep a balance between the influence of the court and the king, and saying, you know, the king is, is, is important, but at the same time, it's not even mentioned. I mean, and, and so, and, um, and the periphery. So it's very interesting how they try to, to have a balance between the two, uh, the two languages. It's a political step, but not, I mean, especially being in Spain right now, it cannot be really uh, considered as, as they are political statements right now. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you feel, I mean, it's especially, of course, they, they were different type of festivities or chronicles. There are other chronicles that were uh, financed by the viceroy or by the court, and then it's completely Spanish. But this really was actually the city itself. Um, and so the use of Spanish is, is more a, a, a decision, I would say. But yes, I mean, it's, I think it's a very interesting work to do there, mm -hmm. how the Valencian uh, is, is used in this chronicle, and these always parts of the, of the ceremonies that were done in Valencian. But preaching, for instance, was sometimes were done in Valencia, sometimes in Spanish, et cetera, so it's interesting. Yes. Okay, so to me it was really interesting that the, the two photos that you showed, one of Valencia and one of Francusco, are very <laughs> identical. And is there, I was wondering, was it, okay, so like the painter, was he being, just copying the image that well, or was it, or like, is there any chronicle evidence? Is there like any chronicle from Cusco saying that the actual procession was also identical to the one? No, I, I mean, there's not a, a text saying that the, 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 the painter actually copied it. No, no, I'm saying like, I'm sorry, so, so uh, I'm saying like, is there a chronicle from Cusco where we can see that also, that not only the paintings were very similar, but also the procession? The no, part. because the actual, I mean, the, these paintings are very interesting. I'm saying that um, they are not the actual processions. Oops, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong. They are not, I mean, the, pa I mean, the paintings is not the actual procession. They mix the actual procession with things like wagons that did not exist at that time in Valencia, so, or in uh, Cusco. So, but that on the other side, we recognize the people, um, the houses, the spectators, so they even, I mean, the people that have studied, they have been exhaustively studied th those, there are like 18 paintings. Uh, so they can even have been able to identify at the, who were, I mean, at the end of the 17th century, some of the people there in the, in the images. But I think um, it's a completely different idea of what is a, a um, a, a, a visual uh, a document that for us is like we try to, it has to be either realistic or, uh, or not realistic, but the mixture between the two things is not part in, in, in our way of looking at, 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 uh, at visual material. Now in the, in the 17th century, it's a different concept of what they are representing. They are representing, you know, a mixture, of a, a potential, we could say, uh, uh, procession. But at the same time, what is, I'm saying is very interesting that is very uh, precise in uh, portraits of people or uh, places. Yes. There is also, I think we have to sort of remember about the school of painting from Cusco, oh, which yes. is very important. And it's, it, it's not, I wouldn't say copying it, it's, a, it's an integration of a it new is. culture. Because yes. they, they, you know, they, they obviously they were artists that we had there, and in the Spanish came, this was added, and you can see that in all the angels painted, for instance. And I mean, absolutely, and I think you're totally right. I think we shouldn't use the word copy, right. but re-elaborating. I mean, it's abs I mean, and we see that absolutely. And uh, mm -hmm. Cusco has an extraordinary school of, of painting. I mean, actually, these paintings they are from several. It's not only by one local artist. We know that. Uh, probably at least three people, different painters participated. And I, I totally agree. I mean, the word uh, copy is not the appropriate. It's, it's really a complete re-elaboration. Mm -hmm. Again, maybe here we are using our, you know, our 21st yes. century idea of, you know, right. copying, plagiarizing, because or. We have to apply that also to literature. I mean, they Yes, were imitation. Is <coughs> anybody could take a document or the text, add it, and. Uh, Nobody and ever questioned that. I was actually yes. expected. Expected the imitation in the re-elaboration. Also, if you go to the cathedral in, in Cusco, mm -hmm. and you see the beautiful painting of the mm -hmm. Last Supper, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Jesus is eating a cuy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a cuy. Cuy? Guinea pig. Oh, my God. <laughs> 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 nice sauce. Uh, well. Yes. On a totally um, backing up, you said that the poster-like broadsides on 
Valencian, exactly. Um, but what was the literacy rate? What I mean, it st they still had to use town criers. Oh think. yes, yes, uh, yes. Definitely, uh, the 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 literacy rate was not uh, very high, and uh, they 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 used town criers. And then here, in some ways, all this event with the three wagons and and throwing these these uh, all these messages. I mean, was a way of 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 maybe orally uh, uh, knowing what was happening. Mm -hmm. So yes, of mm -hmm. course, um, yes. The, I mean, actually it's very interesting, the, the, the verb to read in the 17th century. So if you remember in the Quixote, there is a very interesting scene where a whole family in the Venta, that they are illiterate, they don't know how to read. They talk about the books they read and they are their own preferences. And so the, to read in the 17th century, meant also to hear somebody reading aloud a text. So we very often when in the text we can see people, illiterate people talking about the readings. Mm -hmm. So that's a very interesting use of the, of the word leer, to read, yes. So it was really a much more, I mean, different type of process than today. I mean, it was much more social and yes, it was listening to somebody reading like happens in Don Quixote. It, it's, I'm sort of thinking about what uh, Sylvia <coughs> asked you about the Valencian. Seems to me like that question is very like contemporary question. I've never heard that question because when we are talking about sending something overseas, we would send something in the official language, right? Mm -hmm. But there was no official language at that time. Mm -hmm. 1662? The, the concept of official language is a very, I guess the official language is probably um, uh, I don't know, maybe a 20th century. Uh, no, I mean, when Nebrija starts the first diction dictionary and the grammar and all of that, doesn't that establish it? But I mean, I mean, there is a, I would say maybe a prevalent language or a more, uh, or a language with, you know, more, uh, you know, I mean, humanistic otherwise, word. But otherwise everybody would be talking in South America. But I mean, I think, no, I mean, because it was a language to eventualize. But I mean, maybe the official language was Latin then. I mean, I mean, so, but it was, I mean, the, I don't think there was a, an of, the concept of official today is so specific. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't I think- I thought that when Nebrija started the first grammar, that sort of in a way instituted. Well, Nebrija said this is the language of the empire, but, but that's what Nebrija says. And of course, you know, uh, Castilian was now being all over, you know, all over the place, was becoming an important language of communication, but, that was that doesn't didn't mean that in Valencia uh, all the deliberations over the official documents were in Valencian and people were speaking Valencian, and so that that was not. I mean, and there was so if the Valencia wanted to trade with people in some other parts of the of the peninsula, then yeah, probably you would have to use s Spanish, but 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 it was not a concept that this is the uh, the official language. I mean, special Spain was, was really was not one kingdom. Was really a, I mean, a series of several kingdoms, and there was not anything. When the only thing that maintained everything together was the Inquisition. Was the only thing. I mean, the laws for publishing were completely different in Aragon than in, in, in Castile. So it was it was so really. So when you talk about Philip the Fourth, he is what? He's a he's he's a king of, and then you have the big list. The king of, of Castile, of Aragon, of Sicily, ex and if you read any official document at that time, then it it's never say king of Spain. It says you know king of. I mean officially he's a king of, and then Duke Duke of Milan, etc. So it's a very fragmented. I mean, and I think in some ways, it, I mean, it's, it's this well in a different way. But I mean, it's like it's war. I mean, it's a bit, especially right now. I mean, it's a very bad situation for Spain. But it was. I mean, that came with with the French kings. The Bourbons were the one in the 18th century who tried to centralize. But with the harvest, there was not even laws that applied to all the no taxes or anything. So it was really part of the challenge to rule the empire. It was in every part, it was di different. And this happened with piracy for books. I mean, that uh, Cervantes published the um, Don Quixote in, in with the privilege in Castile. Immediately, there were pirate editions in Valencia, in, in Lisbon, and in Barcelona. 
because the same, the, that law did not apply to the different kingdoms. So it was very fragmented. Mm -hmm. Now, then in the 18th century, things changed with uh, Philip the fifth, the fifth that came from France. But in, in the 17th century, it's, it's quite a fragment, uh, fragmented uh, um, kingdom. And besides, we have the tradition of accepting other languages much more easily than maybe today. <laughs> because, I mean, when you talk about uh, Toledo, and they had all these centers of translation, you know, and people from all kinds of cultures and languages, there was no problem then. Well, yeah, the communications were different, too. <laughs> yes, I think, uh, so yeah, so maybe that. they were so not so much urgently needed. I mean, like today, and everybody needs to speak English, and no. Uh, <laughs> but yes, I mean, uh, but still is a very interesting, uh, a very interesting, uh, because for instance, in France, yes, and I mean, in the, in the 17th century, there was a centralization, and one language became the language of the country, but that never happened in Spain. That never happened in the, in the peninsula. So that was, even if it was a very large, uh, series of kingdoms, I would say, yes. It's a simple question. You said this was a, how large a document? 700 pages? Yes, the Chronicle is 700 is pages. unusual for the time, for that size? It, it's, it, it's unusual because of the cost. Mm -hmm. And now, Valencia, by the way, which is a bit like Valencia today, was completely bankrupted, but then <laughs> spent money that it didn't have in, this, in doing this celebration and then printing a press. <laughs> but it's all the time, I mean, the chronicles are saying, well, there's, there's basically no money. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's unusual because normally for these uh, special events, you will have maybe a pamphlet, of I mean like mm. 20 pages, not all these big, uh, but it was also a very important document for, uh, for, for, and for creating some kind of, of, of urban identity, mm -hmm. which was a very important part of the, of the 17th century Valencia, yes. True. That was now also something very interesting talking about this. I mean, the way I was able to to study this very large print. I mean, um, this very large uh, chronicle is through the internet. Is because now there is a, the, uh, um, a collect. I mean, a collection of in Valencia of uh, a library, a digital library where I can access. And if not, I mean, I think like ten years ago would have been so expensive to get the microfilm and so expensive, I mean, so difficult to work or, you know, going to Valencia, spending time there. So now it's, I can download that and print it. And so it's also incredible how the, the internet is helping us to work in, to access material in archives and-, uh, and the studies or, or change Absolutely, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, which is, so which, is, uh, which is fantastic, yeah. So more. Hi. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.